guy who was so famous, he became mythologized uh, in Chinese history. And we'll talk about that uh, on the talk and afterwards. Jeff? Thank you, Dr. Bob. As you can see from this, my opening slide, I have a photo here I took of a large iconic statue of Xuanzang in front of the Great Wild Goose Pagoda in Xi'an. As you might surmise from this statue or this picture, Xuanzang remains a very well-known historical figure in China. However, in the West, he's really largely unknown even amongst educated people. So I'd like to answer two questions at the beginning of this presentation. First, who was Xuanzang? And second, why are we referring to his real journey to the West? So the next slide will, no, one, one back please. Yeah, Th this slide will give a quick overview of who Xuanzang was. He was a seventh century Chinese Buddhist monk and scholar, also a great linguist. And he's one of the world's greatest trekkers. He spent 16 years on a, and 10,000 miles traveling from China to India and back. And he traveled both the Northern and Southern routes of the Silk Road, which not even Marco Polo did. And he brought back over 657 Sanskrit Buddhist texts from India to China. And he personally translated many of those texts uh, almost up to his dying day. He was still working on translation. And very importantly, at the request of the Chinese emperor Taizong, Xuanzang wrote a historical geography of his journey to India. Okay, the next slide will show why I'm calling my presentation The Real Journey to the West, because this is the fantasy journey to the West, which is based on Xuanzang's journey to India, but it's full of fantastic adventures and it's a, it's a wonderful book and it's the, the most well-known, probably the most well-known story in China. And I bought it the very first month I was in China uh, when we went to a big bookstore in Tianhe, Guangzhou. And, and so I read it and um, it's the uh, picture I have there will, of the book. And then um, on the upper right-hand corner, that's from a, a recent pretty good adaptation of the, of the story. And the main character, is not actually Xuanzang, it's actually Sun Wukong, which, who is Monkey King. And Monkey King, the, the theory is that Monkey King, the, the author of this Ming Dynasty novel transferred Xuanzang's intelligence to Monkey King. Because in the novel, Xuanzang is actually considered as, or he's depicted as weak, dawdling, and gullible, but he was certainly not any of those things. But Monkey King, ends up with uh, being sort of the leader and the, the brains of the whole expedition. All right, so let's go to the next slide. This is an overview of Xuanzang's journey, which started in Xi'an and ended in Xi'an, Chang'an at that time. It was the cap Western capital of Tang, China. The Northern route is in blue. It goes out to Samarkand and then he goes down and then into India. I'm not going to cover his journey in India, except for one slide. Professor Siong uh, is going to cover more of that. And then the Southern route is in the pink at the top. So we can go to the next slide. So sources of information, as I mentioned, he wrote a historical uh, re a geography for Taizong and, and that's called the Report on Western Regions. That's the book on the left and Taizong really wanted, he was, he wanted more information uh, for intelligence about the Western regions and really for political and, and military purposes. But Xuanzang, he gave him that information and he, uh, in very great detail, but he also included a lot of information about Buddhism and lots of stories. And part of it may have been to, to try to convert Taizong to Buddhism, or more importantly, probably to get Taizong more sympathetic to Buddhism, because there was a lot of uh, Taoism at that time was really the, the dominant religion, and there was a tension between Taoism and Buddhism, which actually has continued for a long time since then. 
The next book is uh, actually much more interesting for, oh, no, not, not the next slide, the next book, I'm um, sorry. The, um, it's Hui Li's biography of Xuanzang and Hui Li was assigned to work with Xuanzang on translation and he became a great admirer and a disciple of Xuanzang and I, they must have sat around in the evenings after a hard day of translating and talked a lot about the trip. And so Xuanzang told him a lot of interesting adventures and, and mishaps that he had and then on the trip. And so Hui Li included those in his his biography. So a lot of our really good information about Xuanzang is from this book. And then the next book is Heavenly Khan, which are, it's our discussants book. It's a historical uh, historical fictional biography of Taizong. It's very interesting. It, it really brings them to life rather than just reading a straight history. And then some other sources that uh, we'll discuss later. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, so we need background on the Tang Dynasty. Uh, it's, it's often considered uh, a high point in Chinese civilization. It was very cosmopolitan. And these pictures I took at the uh, Nelson Adkins Museum in Kansas City, which actually has one of the, the most fantastic uh, collections of Tang ceramics I've seen anywhere. Even uh, the National Museum in Beijing doesn't have pieces as large as what I saw at Nelson Adkins. The picture on the left, we actually saw that about a year and a half ago, another presenter did uh, a whole presentation on just Tang ceramics. And uh, this is a woman, she uh, described her as a multitasking person here. She's, got, she's rousing a camel at the same time as breastfeeding a baby. So she's doing a lot. And um, the, the picture on the right is, uh, this is uh, pieces uh, from the Tang dynasty, but a little bit later, these are three color or Sansai uh, ceramics. And that actually became more prevalent later, I think, in the 7th century and, and uh, the 8th century ap after Xuanzang's lifetime. So we can go to the next slide. All right, now we're uh, at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, just down the road from where I am right now on Huntington Avenue. The left picture is a, a, from the late Sui Dynasty, uh, which is the one immediately before Tang. And uh, it's, it's a camel, obviously, with uh, some Central Asian musical instruments on it. And then on the right, we have one actually from exactly Xuanzang's time, the early Tang, and it's a, a, a Bullock-driven cart. And so this is in the MFA. So we can go to the next slide. And now we're back into the Nelson Atkins. This is a picture of four ladies of the court playing polo. So this is, uh, it's well known that women played polo in China during the Tang Dynasty. We talked about that in, the, well, the presenter a year and a half ago talked about it. And um, this, uh, so many museums have these pieces. And, but it, I think it's important to know that the, there was a, and Dr. Xiong will can talk more, much more, much better about this, but there was a lot of Central Asian influence in the, in the uh, Tang, well, in the, uh, the, the uh, Tang dynasty in Xi'an or Chang'an. And it's from the many nomadic groups that had, had invaded China in the north, uh, from the north since the Han dynasty. And so there was a lot of intermarriage. And so even the, uh, the Li family uh, that, our, uh, that Taizong is in had already intermarried with a lot of these nomadic conquerors. And so there's an awful lot of Central Asian and steppe influences, which included riding horses, speaking Turkic and so forth. And so women playing polo, that comes from the Central Asian influence. And also it's important to know that a lot of the aristocracy left Northern China due to this invasion of Northern peoples. And they came, they went down to Southern China, not down to the Yangtze area. And um, they actually looked down on, on the Northerners as being because of this Central Asian semi-barbaric uh, traditions that they had. And so the, I think it's probably safe to say women down there did not, that polo playing was probably not very prevalent there, but in the North, they did play polo and you'll see these ceramics everywhere. So we can go to the next slide. All right, here's Emperor Taizong. He's very important in this story. And we have a discussion that is an expert on him, so I don't need to say much about him, but 
he, uh, he's important. So we can go to the next slide. All right, here's a map of Chang'an during the Tang Dynasty, early Tang Dynasty. And I've circled a temple on the right-hand side there, uh, Qin, Qinlong Temple. And it's also known as Gu Shi Fo Si, which literally means Old Stone Buddha Temple. And the reason I circled it will be apparent on the next slide, which this Guanyin Bodhisattva of Compassion statue is at the MFA. And it, it was actually found at the Old Stone Buddha Monastery near Xi'an. And I have no doubt that Xuanzang saw this statue. So it's, it's always interesting to be right next to something or see something that, the, that a famous person obviously had seen also a thousand years before. And so it's interesting. All right, this statue, it's carved limestone with traces of polychrome and gilding. So I took a picture of the back of the statue that it shows a lot more of the paint. And one interesting thing to note about this statue and actually many ancient statues is they were usually, they were painted. We see the Greek and the Roman statues and they all, you know, they look very uh, classical with the white or the gray or white marble and same with this, but they were all painted and it's been worn off. So this was a painted statue. And also when I first saw it, I immediately thought, oh, Guan Yin, there she is again. Well, this isn't she, this is he. Guan Yin was actually, a, was male up at this period, Guan Yin was still depicted as male and considered male. She really didn't change over till much later. And, but those of us who've lived in China or are from China, we always think of Guan Yin as female because all the depictions of her there are in the temples today, uh, she's considered female. And in the novel, Journey to the West, she's female. So I, I learned that from listening to the uh, MFA's recording connected with the statue, if we could play that. The serene figure standing here is the Chinese Buddhist deity Guan Yin. Guan Yin is the Bodhisattva of compassion, a divine figure in the Buddhist religion who responds to human prayers. In this early sculpture, created around 580 AD, Guan Yin is still a male deity in the Indian tradition. Later, in the 10th century, Chinese artists began to depict Guan Yin with female characteristics. The elegant pose of this figure originated in India, where Buddhism was born. When Buddhism traveled to China, Chinese artists retained some features of Indian sculpture and changed others. They added the closely draped clothing you can see in this figure, which suggests the form of the body beneath without actually revealing it. They gave the face more Chinese features, and they added animation to the figure with the curving scarves that reached to Guan Yin's ankles. The quality and size of this Guan Yin sculpture mean that it was created for an imperial temple. It would have stood in a temple devoted to the cult of Guan Yin, or it may have joined another bodhisattva on either side of a large central Buddha figure. Okay. So we can go to the next slide. And to follow up on this Guan Yin transition, uh, this, this statue is from the Mount Holyoke College Art Museum, which is in the Western part of Mass, where I lived just a couple months ago. And I visited there and I saw, the, Mount Holyoke, by the way, has a huge collection of Chinese art. Very little of it is on display because the museum is very small, but they have a huge collection. And so I'll just read briefly this, the description, which is the only description I've ever seen so clear about her transitioning. Um, it says, all right, uh, Guan Yin is among the most beloved bodhisattvas in Buddhism and is associated with compassion. Uh, the curving lines of the cheeks, lips, and eyes suggest a female feminine deity, while the body's straight lines evoke masculinity. This Intentional androgyny is not unusual for Chinese depictions of Guan Yin in this period. Early images of this period, early images of the Bodhisattva are male, while depictions after the 12th century are mostly female. So she was transitioning there, but uh, in the prior statue, it was male, but 
All right, so we can go to the next statue or the next, um, yeah, the next statue is, is an 11 headed Guan Yin. And this actually is also from the Mount Holyoke College Art Museum. And this is from the time of Xuanzang. I don't know where it's from. I only included it because it is at Xuanzang's time and also because of the 11 heads. I, I don't remember seeing an 11 headed one and I looked it up. The 11 heads symbolize the Buddha's steps on the path to enlightenment. All right, next slide, please. All right, we're back at the MFA. This is another bodhisattva, uh, sort of an anonymous bodhisattva uh, uh, that was found at the um, White Horse Monastery in Luoyang, which was the Eastern capital of the Tang Dynasty. And Xuanzang was born near Luoyang. And he also may have worked or done some translation at the White Horse Monastery. So this is another statue at the MFA, which he may have seen. So we can go to the next slide. All right, so now we've had we've gotten some background on, on art and, and the Tang Dynasty. So let's start going into what type of man Xuanzang was. So this comes, these come, texts come from Hui Li, who definitely admired Xuanzang, but I tend to think that he didn't, he actually accurately described him based on, on people's reaction to Xuanzang as time goes on. So he says, he grasped the essential meanings of all these texts by studying them only once and could memorize whatever had passed his eyes. He studied with such profundity that he could comprehend subtle meanings and reveal what was hidden in the text. And he loved contentment and natural simplicity and did not like social life. Once he entered a place for practicing the way, he would not come out unless there was a summons from the court. And then finally, we have a physical description of him. He was, he was tall for a Chinese man, especially at that time, even Westerners were not this tall. He was just under six feet in stature and his body was of a pinkish white color with broad eyebrows and bright eyes. He was as dignified and solemn as a statue and as handsome as a figure in a painting. His voice was clear and far reaching and he spoke elegant, elegantly and sonorously so that his listeners were never bored. When he walked, he carried himself gracefully looking straight ahead, neither, never glancing sideways. So following up on this physical description, I'd like to go to the next slide. And it said, Whaley says that Xuanzang observed the Vinaya Pitaka without negligence. So the Vinaya Pitaka is a, it's literally the basket of discipline. It's the Buddhist scripture, one of the three parts of the Tripitaka. And in that <clears throat> Vinaya Pitaka, there's uh, four ways of dignified comportment. And one and number one of those four ways is walk like the wind. So what Xuanzang is doing is he's following this. He's walking gracefully with a sense of lightness, just like the wind. Avoid trudging along and dragging the feet. Okay, and so number two is stand like a pine. He had very good posture. So he followed these, these uh, which are actually very good rules for, for all of us to follow, but he followed these uh, without negligence. So let's go to the next slide. All right, so now we'll cover Xuanzang before his trek. He was born into a scholarly family at the very beginning of the seventh century, and he received a strict Confucian education from his, he, he was from a scholarly family, so he, he got the Confucian education. But his brother, his older brother was a Buddhist monk, and so he must have influenced Xuanzang quite a bit. So at the age of 13, he followed in the footsteps of his older brother, and he went to a monastery, and he, by 20, he had already become an ordained monk, and then he spent several years in Chang'an, capital of Tang Dynasty, and he studied Sanskrit and other foreign languages. So we can go to the next slide. And so this, we're trying to here explain why he decided to go on his trek. The, the main problem was that Chinese Buddhism was relying on probably corrupt texts bad translations. They didn't have enough of the original Sanskrit uh, sutras, uh, scriptures to study. And, and there weren't many people in China anyway that knew Sanskrit. So there were a lot of disputes about the meaning of, of Dharma, which is 
basically the teaching of Buddha. And so Xuanzang decided he had to go to India to obtain the original sutra texts. And, and he learned Sanskrit in order to be able to translate those texts when he got back. And he also wanted to study Buddhism under great, uh, great men there in, in India. But at that time, there was a lot of conflict with the Turkish people of the Western regions, and then Taizong had banned foreign travel, but that did not dissuade Xuanzang. He decided he, he, it didn't matter if there was a ban, he was going to go. And uh, he, he was inspired by, well, the, the examples of prior monks, especially Fasien, and he, Xuanzang wrote, a real man should have the ambition to carry forward their tradition. So I think part of it was almost an ego thing. It wasn't just faith, but he, he wanted to prove his own uh, strength to, to follow in these footsteps because this was not an easy journey to take. So we can go to the next slide. So he petitioned, along with a couple other monks, he petitioned the emperor to, for permission to leave China, but there was never an answer from the emperor. So, uh, but luck, luckily for uh, Xuanzang, but not for China, there were some bad harvests in this year of 627. And a decree was issued that allowed people to leave their homes for other parts of China to seek food. So they took advantage of this decree and they traveled uh, on their first step out of Xi out of Chang'an, they traveled to Liangzhou. So we can uh, show a quick clip from a movie uh, that shows this actual uh, proclamation of people being able to, allowed to leave. So you can show the next. So that was him leaving Chang'an. And so we need to get an idea of the geography here. So here is a map of, you'll see Chang'an in the lower right-hand corner. You'll see Urumqi up in the upper left. And uh, uh, his first stop, well, Lanzhou was his first stop, or Tianshui. But this is, what this map is, is the Hishi, the Xi Corridor, which is very important to know, this is the, really the, the corridor which connects China proper to Central Asia. At that time, we'll say Central Asia, now it would be Chinese Central Asia or Xinjiang. So it, it basically goes from Lanzhou or Liangzhou up to Dunhuang and, uh, and the Jade Pass or the, uh, yeah, the Jade Pass. And so at, at that point, the northern and southern routes of the uh, Silk Road diverge. And so this, this is really the main entrance and exit uh, into and out of China. So it's really important to know the Hishi Corridor. It's also known as the Gansu Corridor. So the next slide, I prepared to give you a better idea of the geography. So the map of China is on the upper right-hand corner. The province of Gansu is um, highlighted there. It's right in the middle of China, sort of in the middle of North China. And then the Hishi Corridor, I've circled, and you see Xi'an, I've circled that. Beijing on the right, Urumqi on the left. And to get the idea of the distances, Urumqi to Beijing is 1,500 miles. It's about the same as flying from San Diego to St. Louis. So that gives you an idea of what we're talking about here is first geography. So we can go to the next slide. All right, so he went to Lanzhou first, and then he met a man, 
sending back horses for official use. And so uh, this man, uh, he was able to travel with him to Liangzhou, which was his next stop. And he, he spent a whole month in Liangzhou, which uh, is the capital of the Hishi region. And he, he did a lot of preaching there and he actually uh, made a lot of money. There were a lot of rich merchants there that, um, that he preached. And so he was able to, to accumulate some resources. So we can go to the next slide. And as I said, yeah, he, he received many rich gifts there, but the governor of Liangzhou was strictly enforcing the ban on travel to Western regions. And so he told Xuanzang to return to Chang'an. Xuanzang had become fairly famous there in Liangzhou for his preaching and it became well known he was traveling. He wanted to travel out to India. So, but as ha had happened, in other times, uh, somebody sympathized with Xuanzang, a leading Buddhist teacher sympathized with his intent to travel. So he gave him two disciples to accompany him up through the Hishi, Hishi corridor to the next stop, which would be Guazhou. So we can look at the next slide. So the governor of Guan, Guazhou was also a devout Buddhist and he, was, he welcomed Xuanzang. He was very pleased to have him there. And he warned him about the five watchtowers between the Jade Gate and Hami. We'll see that in a map in a minute. Um, and, and a warrant for the arrest of Xuanzang was issued from Liangzhou. They found out he had left, so they, they issued a warrant. But the, uh, the, the uh, leader of, of Liangzhou sent, uh, his name was Li Daliang, he sent a police officer named Li Chong to, uh, to Liangzhou to deliver this warrant, but I, apparently he, maybe he didn't know that Li Chong was a devout Buddhist. And so when Li Chong met up with Xuanzang, he sort of confronted them and said, are you the wanted man? Are you the man they're talking about in this warrant? And Xuanzang admitted he was, but then Li Chong tore up the warrant. So once again, Xuanzang is saved by sympathetic people. So we can go to the next slide. So here is a, a good map, in my opinion, of so Liangzhou through the Hishi corridor to Guazhou, Guazhou, and then the five watchtowers we're talking about, you see between where I've circled the Jade Gate and then Hami. So it's very important to, when you're studying this region or even interested in it, you need to know about the Jade Gate. Apparently, the, uh, what I copied here was from uh, Sir Oral Stein's uh, description. Um, the Jade Gate actually by Xuanzang's time in the Tang Dynasty was already pretty much in disuse, but it was still there and it was still a landmark. It was really in Han times, it, it controlled all the traffic along the Silk Road. But, um, and it took its name from the precious Jade Yu of Khotan, which from early down to modern times formed an, formed an important article of trade from the Tarim Basin to China. But actually, they, according to Orlstein, they, they didn't even know what exactly where it was at, at, at the turn of the 20th century. That it was still not completely certain where it was, but it's now been located. I uh, included a couple little pictures of it there. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. So, all right, so now he has no more traveling companions. So Xuanzang, whenever he was in trouble, he always prayed and he, his prayers were answered. He was at a shrine where he met a man from the Hu tribe who had come to pay homage to the Buddha. And so they started chatting and the man paid his respects to Xuanzang and requested his teaching. And then they agreed that or the Hu man agreed to be his guide through the notorious five watchtowers on the way to Hami or Yi Wu. And they agreed to meet the next day to start the journey. So we need to know what who, what does who designate? Who, who is a very common term when you're reading about this time. Uh, it, it's a general term for non-Chinese peoples living north and northwest of China. And um, it's also, it's, it's also a very common family name in China. And I don't know if all people named who are, can trace their 
traced back to, to uh, non-Chinese peoples, but it is a common name. In fact, the president of China before the current president, Hu Jintao, has that name. So we can go to the next slide. All right, so this, this is, is uh, information told by Hui Li. So it's, it's very interesting. It really shows Xuanzang maybe wasn't always the calm Buddhist uh, monk that he wanted to be. He, it said, all right, he arrived together, the, the Hu man arrived together with an old man of the Hu tribe riding on an aged lean horse of reddish color. Xuanzang was displeased at seeing this old man, but the younger man assured him that the older one had made the trip to Hami more than 30 times. Now, the old man tried to talk Xuanzang, Xuanzang out of going because of the danger. He, he, this is the quote. If you insist on going, you had better ride my horse. This horse of mine has traveled to Yi Wu 15 times. It is sound and knows the way well. Yours is too young to travel such a long distance. So Xuanzang had remembered that, yes, a, foreign, a fortune teller had told him that he would be making his journey to the West on an old lean horse of reddish color. So he did the exchange. The old man was very happy that he got a a young horse, and he gave his old horse to Xuanzang. So let's go to the next slide. So now this is the next adventure, maybe one of the most dramatic adventures that Hui Li tells us about. So they're, they're bunking down. They, they'd already gotten to the, they could see the, the jade gate in the distance. It's midnight, must have been a full moon. They could see it. And so after they bunked down, they were about 50 paces apart and then Xuanzang noticed that the guide was coming towards him with a knife. So what did Xuanzang do? He quickly got up and began reciting prayers and so at that point the guide turned back. He had a guilty conscience I guess and so in the morning though the guide said your disciple considers that the journey ahead is too long and dangerous. There's no water, no grass and you can only get these things at the five towers and at the five towers, if you're discovered, we'll be, we shall be dead men, so it is safer to turn back. But that did not dissuade Xuanzang. He, he just gave, he re released the Hu guide from his services and gave him a horse. And so now Xuanzang is on his own. So the next slide, we have another adventure, which is, can be shown in movies very well. Xuanzang is out in the desert alone on this skinny red horse. And what happens, he loses his way and then he drops his water bag. And now he's, he's literally dying of thirst. A couple days go by. And, but Xuanzang, as Hui Li says, Xuanzang prayed to Guan Yin and it, it was answered with a cool wind at night. And, but the horse led, as horses can do and camels too, they know where water is. The horse led him to what we think is Wild Horse Spring. It's an actual spring there. Uh, Hui Li says that maybe Guan Yin actually uh, made the spring pop into existence just at that time, but it was, we'll, we'll go with it, it was Wild Horse Spring. And so he got there and he was saved thanks to the, thanks to the, the skinny old horse. So let's go to the next slide. All right, so now we're in, uh, we're in Hami and he, uh, Xuanzang I, is already famous, probably from some of the preaching in Liangzhou, but he's got an invitation from the king of Gaochong or Turpan or Turfan uh, that he wanted to meet him. And so Xuanzang actually changes his plans and heads to Turpan. And so he arrives outside of Turpan and, and the king is so excited when he hears that he's arrived. He, sent, he, he goes personally along with the queen to meet Xuanzang and takes him back to the, the palace. And so let's go to the next slide. And so, all right, so now I'm in Turpan. I have to digress a little bit to uh, journey to the west, the fantasy. So this is Flaming Mountain. And um, this is where, let's go to the next slide, uh, where a famous story from from uh, COG, Journey to the West takes place. And it's, it's the, uh, the famous uh, time of, of, of Monkey King fanning the flames of faint, Flaming Mountain. So we can watch a, a very short clip of description of, of the first cartoon feature of this. Interesting start.
1941, Journey to the West became the first Chinese feature-length animated film, when Chapter 59 became the plot to Princess Iron Fan. It fudges the story a little bit to include Pixie and Sandy a little more, but overall it's really not too bad adaptation-wise, covering the troop discovering that their path is blocked by a fiery mountain, being informed in a local village that the only thing that can quell this fire is a fan of a local demon who refuses to lend it to them because Monkey had a run-in with her son, Red Boy, fighting her, getting a fake fan which makes the fire worse, impersonating her husband, Bull Demon King, to get the genuine article, then having to fight the real Bull Demon when he shows up looking for revenge. Okay, that's... ...dubbed by the BBC no. and became a cult classic. We can stop it now. All right. All right. So now, as often happened, Xuanzang was so popular and so sought after that people wanted him to stay. And so the king of Turpan wanted him to stay so badly that he actually, for, he, he said that he would force him to stay. And so when Xuanzang refused, he actually went on a hunger strike. And then the king felt so ashamed, he finally relented. But he, Xuanzang had to stay a couple more months to preach, and, or one more month. And so he, he received a lot of gifts, uh, 20, 30 horses, 25 carriers, and, but most importantly, letters of introduction to 24 countries for his continuing journey. So we can go to the next slide. And so now we're going from Turpan to Kucha. And Kucha is important because it's near, it's where Kizil is, which is the site of the famous Thousand Buddha Caves. And I'm going to include, a, show a few of those pictures because I'm absolutely positive Xuanzang visited those caves because Hui Li says that they spent a couple months here be, waiting for the pass through the ice mountains to open and because it must have been like late winter, or early spring, and that Xuanzang actually spent time sightseeing. So the sightseeing must have been in these caves. So let's, let's take a look at the caves. All right. This briefly, Kizil uh, represents an extension to Central Asia of the Indian tradition of excavating and painting caves. And uh, the last sentence says, the striking green and blue of these, of the palette of the Kizil frescoes is uniquely Kuchayan. So let's look at these frescoes. All right, so the ones that I've chosen are from the older Western school, which is from 500 to 700 AD, so, and, that, uh, and not the later Eastern school, which is 650 to 950, which is around the Turfan oasis. That was after Xuanzang. So the older Western school is, has strong Indian and Iranian influences. The Indian influence is the way the subjects are depicted. Um, and the serene, tranquil portrayal of the Buddha. And then the Iranian comes in the pictorial details, especially of dress crowns and other ornaments and the many decorative ribbons and, and borders. So this is the cowherd Nanda. He was a famous disciple, early disciple of, of Buddha. And um, all right, the next slide, please. And here's a seated Vajrapani. Uh, cave of the statues, and uh, here it says that his almond-shaped eyes, his narrow mustache, and his cross-shaped navel are characteristics that are very commonly found in contemporary Indian art. So the next slide is a uh, head of a bodhisattva, and it uh, also looks a lot like the prior one as far as the almond eyes and flaring nostrils, finely drawn mustache. Okay, we can go to the final picture here of the swimmers. And this is uh, from the Cave of the Seafarers. And this is uh, uh, from a famous uh, two uh, legends. And it's basically about karma. And it's uh, apparently the strong, confident looking swimmer in the upper right has good karma and bad karma. The, the, the uh, swimmer that looks very nervous and is floundering. So this is really, it's, it's an illustration of karma. So let's go to the next slide. All right, so now we go from Kucha to Tokmak. And on the way, they meet 2,000 Turkish bandits, but the Turkish bandits are fighting amongst themselves, so they leave Twensong alone. And so now, the, this is the lead into the, the probably the worst seven days of the entire 16 years journey, where it's the crossing of the ice mountains. All right, and Hueli says that uh, over those seven days, three to four of every 10 fellow travelers died of hunger and cold, and the bulls and horses suffered even more. 
So let's the next slide. All right, here's a map. All right, we last month Professor Zhang showed us the Warm Lake. So there's Warm Lake, if you remember, in Kyrgyzstan, and that's north of Xinjiang. And so the border there, Xuanzang, uh, passed through the Bedel Pass on the China Kyrgyzstan border. And so he's down, we're talking about he's down in Beluga now, and he has to cross the Stony Desert, and then he has to make this terrible crossing through the Bedell Pass. So we can go to the next slide. And here's a picture of the Bedell Pass today, a, 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 a fire beacon. It's actually good weather there now, but the next slide will show what it looked like when Xuanzang passed. And his words were, can't see it. I, I crossed. I crossed a stony desert and reached the ice mountains located on the northern side of the Pamir Range. The snow, uh, snow is in the valleys, which are freezing even in the spring and summer seasons. The path is dangerous, and the cold wind blows ferocious dragons that give trouble to travelers. It is difficult to escape alive. Those are Xuanzang's own words from his report to the on Western regions to the emperor. This is the type of information the emperor would want because it's, it, this has military significance. It would be hard to march an army through there. So let's go to the next slide. So now we've, we've passed through there. We, we've survived that, uh, that. Well, some of us survived it, a lot of people didn't. And so now we're up to the warm sea, which we talked about last month. And it's, it's called the warm sea or is it cool today? And it's actually a, a very uh, nice, summer resort and it's only called warm sea because it doesn't melt or it doesn't freeze and it doesn't freeze because it's salty. So let's go to the next slide. All right, so now he gets to the, the great Khan of the Western Turks and now he's almost all the way out to, uh, uh, he's close to Samarkand now. All right, so he, he says that um, he had a big feast. The great Khan had a big feast for Xuanzang and uh, Xuanzang liked the music. He said, the music of the alien tribes tinkled and clanged in symphony. And although the melodies were foreign and lacked refinement, they were quite amusing to the ear and delightful to the mind. So they had a big feast. The Khan and his retinue did a lot of eating of good meat and fish and Xuanzang had his grapes and, and pancakes and so forth. And then he was asked to preach the Dharma. And of course he immediately converted the Khan to uh, Buddhism. So let's go to the next slide. So he, uh, the Khan provided Xuanzang an interpreter and letters of introduction, yeah, actually from Takmak to, to Samarkand. And so he, he uh, reached Samarkand and he was greeted by the king there and he stayed a night and he converted that king also to Buddhism. And then uh, just a quick story, he that Xuanzang and a couple of his tenants went to worship Buddha at a, at a deserted monastery. And, and he, they were driven out with fire by the Hu people. And the king was going to cut their hands off in, in punishment for this, this uh, assault. But Xuanzang intervened and, and stopped them from getting mutilated. So let's go to the next slide. So here's a, here's a, a portrait of, of, of some, uh, it's a mural from, from that, from Samarkand, and it uh, shows Chinese ambassadors from the Tang court at the Western Turk Khaganate, and they're carrying uh, silk, they're carrying uh, uh, materials for silk making, and then on on the right are the Turkish, uh, the Turkish delegates, and they they're recognized by their long plates, and so it's interesting to know that, of course, when the Qing Dynasty took over, then they enforced on the Chinese people the wearing of, of long of, of the, the long plates or the cues. So, but at that time, we see the Chinese don't have them. All right, the next slide, please. All right, so this is my one slide on India. Professor Siong has, has much more information on India. There I am at Sarnath many years ago, and that's the, where the Deer Park is, and, and the Deer Park is where the Buddha preached his first sermon, and of course, Xuanzang visited there as, along with the birthplace of Buddha, of the Buddha in Nepal. So we can go to the next slide. All right, so now we're getting, as I said, we're not covering India, or I'm not, and so we're getting him back into China. 
So we're not sure what pass he took to get back into uh, Xinjiang. It wasn't called that then, but to get back into Chinese Central Asia. But um, Dr. Or, uh, Sir Oral Stein thinks that he went through the Paiyik Pass. And the, his last stop or the last notice uh, stop before the pass was Great Dragon Lake. And Xuanzang described this lake. And Xuanzang, this shows that Xuanzang did provided a lot of information about flora and fauna in this report too. It says, he says, the lake has a very sweet and refreshing taste. In the water dwell sharks, hornless dragons, fish, normal dragons, soft-shell turtles, alligators, and tortoises. And floating on the water are mandarin ducks, swans, wild geese, and bustards. The huge eggs laid by various birds are left in the wild among the marshes on sandy islets. So, next slide, please. So here's a picture of the one end of the Great Dragon Lake called Lake Zorkel now, and it's looking south into Afghanistan. So we're in uh, Tajikistan looking south. So let's go to the next slide. All right, so here's a map. I located, all right, you see the Wakhan corridor of Afghanistan. That's a, sort of that uh, panhandle that sticks out of Afghanistan. And if you're looking at maps, that can sort of always orient you if you can see that panhandle, then you know that you're, uh, China's just to the, the east and Tajikistan's to the north and Pakistan's to the south. And so the Payak Pass is there I, in the, the red diamond. The Tangitar or Tangatar Gorge, that's where Xuanzang was attacked by bandits and lost his elephant. And um, all right, the next slide, please. The only place I could locate the Tangitar Gorge was from a map that Sir Oral Stein made. And, and uh, if you put Tanjitar into Google Maps, you get nothing. You get almost nothing just even doing a search on it. But Oral Stein, who uh, he called Xuanzang his patron saint, he carried the, the report on Western regions around with him in Central Asia as he was excavating and exploring. And actually, Oral Stein did. He, he covered more miles than Xuanzang did in Central Asia. And he, he lost toes to frostbite. He had a horse fall on him and he was injured severely. And, but he's a, he's a great explorer and a great archeologist and scholar. And, and you need to read Oral Stein. He's actually a great writer, although I think all, most of his books are out of print. But there's Tanjatar. And I was able to locate it exactly because he's got the coordinates there, 38 degrees north, 76 degrees east. All right, next slide, please. So here's a picture of the, of the gorge where Xuanzang lost his elephant. All right, next slide. So here's, here's the area we're talking about today. It's, uh, th this is a highway, the Karakoram Highway, which goes from Pakistan into Xinjiang, China. And so it actually doesn't go through the Paiyuk or that pass, but it, it goes through another one, but it goes up through Tashkirk and on the way to Kashgar, which presumably was the route that uh, Xuanzang took once he, he got through into Xinjiang. So let, next slide, please. So now he's arriving in Kashgar. And uh, as you know, Kashgar is a major city in the far Southwest of Xinjiang. And um, he was impressed with, it was called Kashi, or I guess in Chinese it's actually called Kashi. Uh, it's mostly desert, but crops are abundant and there are plenty of flowers and fruits. The people tattoo their bodies and have green eyes. They also compress the heads of their newborn babies into flat shape. So th this, this information that he's telling Taizong about Kashi, because it wasn't yet part of, of the Chinese empire. It had been part back in the Han times, but not now. All right, next slide, please. All right, so now he has a long stay in Khotan. And uh, he also was impressed with Khotan. There's lots of cereals and fruits and, and the country produces rugs and so forth. And the king of Khotan welcomed him and wanted him to stay there too. But he, and so he spent a lot of time there, but mostly because he had lost many of the, he had lost a large bundle of, of, of scriptures in the Indus River coming out of India. So he had to, he wanted to wait. He had sent back word to please send replacements for these and they, they were on the way. So he waited in Khotan. And so, and while he was in Khotan, he wrote a letter to Taizong uh, 
announcing that he had gone to Brahmanic countries, venturing to act against the law and the regulation to seek Dharma, and he was now on his return journey. So we can go to the next slide. And here's a quick picture of man from Khotan. And this is actually from a Chinese, uh, or man of, from Khotan visiting the Chinese Tang court. And it's by a famous Chinese artist, Yan, Yan Li Ben, and who lived the, almost exactly the same time as Xuanzang, just 10 years later, or he lived 10 years longer. And he was a court painter. And um, this is a part of a famous uh, version of Leon portraits of periodical offerings, but it shows a man, a true man from Khotan. So this is exactly what they look like. This was painted almost exactly at the time or just a few years after Xuanzang was there. So we can go to the next slide. All right, here's a, uh, here is a, a, a votive panel that was actually discovered by Sir Oral Stein. I just found out that this morning and it's from, it's from Co near Khotan. And it was, it's dated either the sixth, seventh or eighth century, they're not sure, but it shows a, a, a famous uh, story of a Chinese princess who smuggled mulberry seeds and eggs of the silk moth to Khotan. I think she, she was going to be married to a, like a king or a prince in Khotan and she smuggled this, this very, regulated material to Khotan because China did not want other people to know how to make silk. But she, she, the story is that she, she was the one that got the, got the uh, information out. And so this is a, a and, and also Xuanzang related this story in record of the Western regions. All right, so the next slide. So where he's on, now he leaves Khotan. Oh, he receives a reply from Emperor Taizong who's very happy to hear that he's coming back and he wants him to immediately come and see him, the emperor. And so the governor of Dun Dunhuang has been ordered to receive the teacher in the desert and at Shanshan. And uh, Shanshan used to be called Loalan. And just quickly, Loalan now is famous for what's called the Loalan beauty. She is a natural mummy that is from about almost 2000 BC and was found near Lolan. And uh, she's actually, what's famous about her is she's actually of European descent. Her people came from Europe, probably by way of Siberia down to that area. And um, I saw her at the uh, Xinjiang Museum in uh, Urumqi and also a full model of what they think she looked like. And yes, she looked she looked just like somebody in my family, I guess. So it was it was very interesting and she's very famous, Lolan beauty. All right, so we can go to the next slide. So here we have the Dun, Dun Huang and uh, Shazhou, which means sand city. Next slide, please. All right, so now he, re, he re, uh, arrives at Dun Huang. He wrote another letter to the emperor. And so the emperor was about to leave on a, on a military expedition and he wanted, and so Xuanzang was worried he would be, wouldn't get there in time. So he, now he rushes to Xi'an. All right, so let's go to the next slide. And so he's met that Taizong sent his prime minister to meet Xuanzang at the Juqie gate. I've circled it in red. And there were like 10 miles long of people welcoming him, welcoming him welcoming Xuanzang back to, to Xi'an or Chang'an. And one interesting thing, exactly 10 years before the prime minister was sent to meet Xuanzang, he was also sent to meet a Christian mi missionary named Alopen from, the, from uh, Byzantine Syria or what, and this is actually all in a, on a steel in the, in the Xi'an steel forest. It's the story of of this uh, of the Christian missionaries in China at that time, I didn't know they they had come, come so early. But um, from and they describe it as being from Da Qin, which is Chinese for Roman Empire. Uh, you know, the characters Da and Qin, which is the uh, the dynasty before the Han. So that's that's China's name for ancient Rome or the Roman Empire. So I think it illustrates Taizong was. Not, he was not only intellectually curious and interested in, in all religions, but he, anybody that came from the West, he wanted information and, and he definitely wanted to talk to him. So, 
So um, Trenzong had some uh, Christian uh, competition there. So the next slide. So this is a picture of Xuanzang's returning to Chang'an. I don't actually know where it's from, but I found it. Uh, there's no description of where, it, where what it's from. So we can go to the final slide, I think. Yes, and so this is just a quick recap of Taizong and Xuanzang and, and how Xuanzang wanted to get, to educate Taizong in Buddhism. And also, it's important that the emperor tried to persuade Xuanzang to renounce his vows and become a court official. This is the, the so many instances of people wanting Xuanzang to stay or to work for them. And this is the highest level of all the emperor himself wanted Xuanzang to be his like personal assistant and be in the court always, but Xuanzang would not do it. But he did, um, the, the emperor did help him by setting up a, the, the translation team and, and giving him good quarters for that. And, and finally, dust in the wind, it says, Xuanzang and Taizong gradually came to understand and become more trusting of each other. Still, the policy of Taoism before Buddhism continued without change. Professor Xiong can talk more about that, but that's, that, that's uh, my final words on this subject. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you uh, very much. And uh, this is a great uh, talk, Jeff. Um, and uh, I have a whole bunch of issues that I want to mention, uh, but I thought uh, we would hear uh, Professor Shang first. Uh, uh, among my questions are, I can imagine losing your keys. I, I have trouble imagining how you lose an elephant. Uh, but uh, let's hear uh, Victor first. Victor, would you like to uh, comment on this uh, wonderful discussion of uh, uh, of the uh, um, of the uh, monk uh, Shen Zhang? Oh, oh yes. Uh, uh, you can you can hear me, okay? Yes, we can hear you All fine. Right. Well, I, I think Jeff has given a, a wonderful lecture on on Xuan Zhang. Uh, by, by the way, the, the Chinese character Zhang has two pronunciations. One is Zhang, the other is Zhuang. Zhuang is wrong, and it should be Zhang instead. Okay, here I would like to add a few details. First, um, well, let's, let's roll the slide. Yeah, this is a little bit of the propaganda. And this is one of the uh, books I published recently. It's called A Thorough Exploration in Historiography. Historiography. It is uh, a masterpiece written by a Tang Dynasty historiographer. His name is Liu Zhiji, and never been translated into a uh, into a Western language before. Now um, it is there, and and, and the, the beauty of this uh, edition is is bilingual. And go ahead, the next slide. And you can see here uh, the Chinese text, and uh, alongside the 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 English translation. Okay. Uh, next, yeah, this is another book I published this year. Uh, it's the, the about the uh, the greatest female sovereign probably in world history, and her, na her name is Wu, Wu Zetian. And and again, this is a historical novel, so it's now available on Amazon. Okay, next, right, go ahead. Yeah, about uh, Xuanzang. And uh, when he arrived in the great city of Chang'an, the capital, he settled down in the Great Zhuangyan Monastery, Great Zhuangyan Monastery. And this is not a, an ordinary monastery, this is the royal monastery. And it was magnificent with uh, towering halls and large houses. Okay? And, and, and it was renowned as the grandest monastery in the capital city and in the entire country as well. Xuanzang, a young man, got to live there thanks to the good offices of a very important man uh, whose name was Xiao Yu, who was a vice president of the Department of State Affairs. And the painting below is the painting of the monastery from Dunhuang, probably a painting dating back to the 9th century. Uh, you can see um, the magnificence. 
Okay. Next. Uh, Chang'an at the time was the largest city by area in the world, um, probably by population as well. And in the southwest corner, and its location of the Great Zhuangyan Monastery in Chang'an, you can see here where the red uh, arrow is. Okay, go ahead. Uh, because of contradictions in existing sutras and commentaries, Xuanzang decided to search for some original texts in India. There's one particular text Xuanzang was eager to see. It was Yogacara Bhumi Shastra, meaning treatise on the foundation for yoga practitioners. It is believed to have been composed by Maitreya Bodhisattva. Okay. So, um, and, and when, when he heard that Master Siddhabhadra was teaching the Yoga Sutras at Nalanda Monastery, Xuanzang's desire to travel to India grew even stronger. Some scholars speculate that Xuanzang may have learned this piece of important information from the renowned Indian monk, uh, Prabhakara Mitra. He was then visiting Chang'an. Next. Xuanzang's first stop is Wu Wei in Liangzhou. Liangzhou. While there, at the request of the local people, Xuanzang gave a series of lectures on subjects such as Nirvana, Mahayana Suma, uh, uh, Samkuraha, or Mahayana summary, or prajna, or transcendental wis wisdom. And these lectures earn him great acclaim. Before his departure, he received a, a huge amount of gold, silver, and horses as gifts. Um, but he could only accept a portion of these, donating the rest to various Buddhist monasteries. During the Tang dynasties, when traveling long distances, passing through waterway and road checkpoints, it is necessary to present uh, travel documents known as guosuo for inspection. Um, okay, so is it right here. Yeah, this is at the bottom, you see um, a, a piece of guosuo dating back to Tang Dynasty. Surprisingly, Xuanzang didn't have these, yet for him, domestic travels remain relatively smooth. And this could be attributed to the fact that inspection and enforcement of travel documents at that time were not strictly enforced, you know, within the country's borders. Next. Next, we're in Gaocha. I think Jeff already gave uh, a good coverage. Um, this is Xuanzang's first major stop outside Tang China. Xuanzang was received by none other by, uh, than the king himself, Qi Wentai. And Gaochang at the time was still an independent oasis state, right. but that would, that would not last long. And, and the, the, the state would be annexed by Tang China in the year 640. King Qi Wentai was a devout Buddhist who was deeply impressed with Xuanzang's knowledge, Xuanzang's character, and Xuanzang's faith. So he tried to persuade Xuanzang to stay in Gaochang forever. He said, uh, although our community of monks is small, we have several thousand members. While you are giving a lecture, I can ask them to hold sutras for you or serve as your audience. So he's very sincere. But Xuanzang have a higher calling. He politely declined the offer. But Qi Tai was not willing to let Xuanzang go. So Xuanzang then went on the foot and water strike for three days and three nights. Um, seeing Xuanzang was on the brink of death and Qi Wentai, the king, was mortified and he accepted Xuanzang's request to leave. At Qi Wentai's request, the two took an oath to become sworn brothers before a Buddha statue. Xuanzang then stayed on in Gaochang for another month to deliver lectures on Prashna Paramita Sutra for humane kings. Uh, Prashna Paramita means perfection of wisdom, uh, wisdom. And oh, it is now considered an apocrypha, that is a fake, but that's irrelevant. 
Chairman Tai had a large tent set up for that purpose that would accommodate over 300 people for Xuan Zhang's lectures. Before each lecture, Chi Wentai the king personally carried a small incense burner to welcome Xuan Zhang into the tent. He would kneel down and allow Xuan Zhang to step onto his back in order to climb into his high seat. At Xuan Zhang's departure, even uh, Chi Wentai presented generous gifts to him, which would be enough for his travel expenses for the next 20 years. I think including four monks, 25 laborers, 30 horses, 100 tails of gold and 30,000 silver coins and 500 bolts of silk. Next. Uh, well, uh, okay, next, we already covered this. Yeah, next is the Nalanda Monastery which is in north of Rajagraha or Rajkriya in North India. Uh, anyway, go ahead. Not long after, not long after leaving Gaochang, the Xuanzang arrived at uh, Suyap or Suiye in present-day Tokmak, Kyrgyzstan. And he received a warm welcome from the Western Turkic Khanate ruler, Tong Yehu or Tong Yapgu, Tong Yapgu. From there, he entered North India through Central Asia. Finally, in the year 631, he reached the renowned Nalanda Monastery near Rajgya or Rajagraha, a true pronunciation of the same place. And that was the highest seat of learning of Buddhism in India. Xuanzang studied there for five years under the guidance of the ma master Shilabhadra, focusing primarily on Yukatara Bhumi Shastra, treatise on the foundation for yoga practitioners. Naranda Monastery was founded in the early 5th century and was destroyed by the Turks in the late 12th century. Okay. Next. Yeah, here you can see the two. Um, and uh, um, uh, the, on the left, you have the, 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 the city Sui, Suiye, uh, which was the capital of the uh, Western Turkey Karni. Uh, uh, next. Afterwards, Xuanzang traveled throughout India, visiting and paying respects to Buddhist historical sites. In 642, he participated in the Great Assembly, known as the Uncovered Assembly, held in the city of Kanad in Uttar Pradesh in India. The assembly, which lasted about 75 days, was presided over by King himself, King Hasha. Princess and the noble, high nobles, scholars from Mahayana and uh, Hinayana traditions, as well as and those believe, believing in Brahmanism, they all attended the event. Xuanzang delivered profound teachings on Mahayana Buddhism, and none of the attendees were able to refute his arguments, earning him great fame. King Hasha himself, through extensive conversations with Xuanzang, became interested in Chinese culture and subsequently sent envoys to Tang China to meet Emperor Taizong. At last, we have a look at the insights from Xuanzang's travel. Next slide. Okay. At the time, uh, the region west of the uh, Gansu and Shanxi area, extending into the heartland of Central Asia, was controlled by the Western Turkic Khanate, led by the outstanding ruler Tong Yehu or Tong Yapgu. Kahan or Khan. Tong Yabgu Kahan remained a, a, good, uh, a good friend with the Tang Dynasty. To the west, uh, there were several major powers. Sasanian Persia was the major rival to Western Turkic Khanate, but due to its long standing wars against the Byzantines, uh, Persia 
Persia lacked the power to threaten Central Asia and North India in the East. Meanwhile, a powerful ruler named King, Kasha, uh, King Hasha emerged in North India. Under his rule, uh, the Hasha Empire experienced social stability and improved the living conditions for its people. The Western Turkey Khanate under Tong Yapgu dominated Central Asia and was devoted to Zoroastrianism, also known as the religion of fire worshippers. That's the religion of the Persians. On the other hand, King Hasha of India was a devout follower of Brahmanism, which could be considered a, a branch of Hinduism. But in later years, he leaned towards Buddhism. Zoroastrianism and Brahmanism were rivals to Mahayana Buddhism, a, a, a kind of Buddhism Xuanzang believed. However, both rulers, Tong Yabugu and Hasha, demonstrated a strong spirit of religious tolerance and supported the activities of the Buddhist monk Xuanzang. In the late 620s, the vast area Xuanzang passed through enjoyed a stable domestic and international environment in places such as Shanxi, Gansu, Xinjiang, Central Asia, and India. Human relations were by and large favorable. All this contributed to excellent conditions for Xuanzang's successful travels to the West in search of Buddhist texts. Um, that's, that's, that's all, that's the end. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you to both of you. And uh, I found this to be a remarkable uh, talk because it was a topic that, uh, that I, as a non-Chinese person, knew very little about. And, uh, and I want to ask Victor a question first uh, mm -hmm. about 